Well, welcome to Voices of Women. I'm your host, Chris Stainis, and the founder of Women of Wisdom Foundation. We host a conference every year in Seattle, Washington since 1980. Oh, sorry, what year was it? 1993. <laughs> We've been around since 1993. So we're having our 29th annual conference this March 11th through the 14th. Our theme is Celebrating Spirit of Women, United We Are One. And it is going to be online, a virtual conference for the very first time. Our special guests are Louisa Tisch and Terry Tempest Williams. So we're very excited to have this conference. People from around the world can join us and experience what it means to be a woman of wisdom. Lots of experiential workshops to choose from and also panel discussions on topics of interest for women, and um, which include racial equity, stories of intergenerational women and reinventing community. You can read all about it at womanofwisdom.org. So today I'm interviewing one of our workshop presenters, Sid Fredrickson. Sid's history of living in groups and intentional communities began in 1983. She is enthusiastic about maintaining local and regional networks of intentional communities. Sid has served on community networks in numerous ways, including being a board member with the Northwest Intentional Communities Association. After decades of facilitating, advising, and bringing intentional communities together for many types of events, Sid founded the service Under One Roof in 2019 to provide coaching and workshops for new and existing cooperative groups. She's going to give a workshop on Saturday afternoon, March 13th. It's called Cooperative Living, Finding or Crafting the Community You Desire. So welcome, Sid. So glad to have you on the show and also at the conference. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. So tell us about yourself. What drew you to live your life in groups of people, you know, whether sharing land, residences, and, and other resources for most of your life? You know, 1983, that was quite a while ago. Yeah, I still was uh, not even 20. And I felt as soon as I was away from uh, my parents' home and going to college that it was interesting. You know, I loved it. I immersed myself in it. But even more so than living with one other person in a room, I was eager to get to sort of a pod situation where we shared a living room and shared a bathroom and then moved off campus and got into a cooperative house where we were even more able to cook together and create the kind of culture that we wanted there. And that was very empowering. And so I just continued to pursue that. Yeah, so it reminds me of my college days too. I think it's just one quarter in a dorm and then it was off campus and shared, shared um, where you rented a room and then shared shared um, living spaces and kitchen and then sharing mm -hmm. housing, you know, having getting together with friends and sharing housing it brings me back to my my 20s and that's, you know, fond memories and, and a lot is learned. And I'm just wondering for you, what, what, what is brought to you? Um, how has it changed your life? Well, I had a taste of it in those college days, which many of us had, and some people didn't have the greatest experience then, but it also wasn't as intentional as some of the things that I went on to pursue. Um, I actually had a college professor direct me to some of the historical and contemporary intentional communities and because it was sort of the beginning days of the internet, there were not resources that were easy to find, but I did through a magazine ad hear about the Federation of Egalitarian Communities. And that just like was right up my alley. A lot of influences, like I had read B.F. Skinner's Walden II. Um, mm -hmm. I, and, and the community that I ended up joining after visiting a handful uh, was kind of inspired by that. I was drawn to it because it was secular and it didn't have one leader, like either, you know, political or spiritual leader. It was a rotating set of different planners on the board and then different manager areas. And I just, I had the concept be, uh, it just came alive for something that would be a pro-feminist and um, kind of a, a worker, oriented, liberated feeling where you make your own schedule, you choose the kind of work that you want to do. There were no bosses and none of us had wage jobs off of that farm. We just did things to maintain the farm and had cottage industries where we sold things to non-communards. <laughs> 
And it, you know, it feels like it'd be such a re so rewarding to live in that kind of community of uh, truly sharing and sharing your gifts, like, you know, and then learning from other people. So you're learning new skills too. Um, let's talk about intentional communities, what that means, because it's kind of a large umbrella now, and it, it, there's a lot of things that are, are um, a part of that. Indeed, it is good to um, say that that encompasses a lot of different styles of community. It's my go-to umbrella term for anything from, you know, urban to rural, small, one household to many, many people living together. Um, it can be a cooperative where people have a share in an entity and whole buildings are owned together like apartment buildings or they're, they function kind of like condos except the people that live there actually own it, not some other management company. Um, there's communes like the type that I said that I lived on and everything was actually pooled. Everyone got the same exact allowance. There wasn't um, anything really like cradle to grave that was not provided for a member while you were there. And then there's co-living, which is kind of interchangeable with co-householding, but co-living a lot of times is what is, um, well, I may go more deeply into that later, but let's just say co-living or co-householding is sharing one house together or being in a building where everyone kind of has their own bedroom and it might be like not owned by you, owned by one person or a management company and you share the common spaces. And then co-housing is a term where each household buys in and owns their own unit. And then there's typically a planned neighborhood and a common house. <clears throat> with say commercial kitchen and some other facilities that are there for the community's use. But you can invest and have equity in your house and a share of the commons as well. So all of those different kinds of things from, you know, again, rural to suburban to urban, small to large, ownership, spiritual, secular, all those things belong under this big umbrella of intentional community. So, so where are these found? How do people find these? Well, I would say it's really incredibly easy now that we have the internet and we've got decades behind us of accumulating descriptions and maps and tools to find them and more spin-off networks. But the biggest uh, portal into this world, I would say, is the website ic.org for intentional community. And that is run by the Foundation for Intentional Community. They have also put out at least seven or eight book editions, hard copy of thick directories of intentional communities. And then there's regional networks. There's also a co-housing uh, group that's called Co-Housing US. There's a website that has that type of thing for forming and where places have openings. And for a regional example, like you'd said, the Northwest Intentional Communities Association, they have a page that has listings of opportunities wanted or situations available and across the board. Again, some rental, some for sale, and then sometimes even local municipalities. There's like, for instance, a Facebook group that we have here in Seattle that is called the Seattle Cooperative Housing Network. And people can mm -hmm. use that for free and find out. Mostly those are rental situations that are turning over, but there's a range of things that have been and can be listed there. So uh, what do you advise people to work on when they start uh, either wanting to look for one or want to create one, a, co a cohesive community of people living together? What do you, how do you, how do they start? What do you advise people to start with? Well, there's a lot of emotion around finding any place where someone feels at home and feels a sense of community. And there's like sort of a big blob of um, imagined things and projections like how it would be. And I help people kind of define what are their most important selecting factors if they're searching for one and can sort of help guide the way, even if it's just to get an example of um, talking to someone there or visiting and then just say, oh, that's actually not, that has some of the things I want, but carrying out that learning and looking further for something that's even a better fit. For people who are starting their own communities, I have worked with groups 
to, um, you know, usually they have a felt sense of what they want, but to put it into words in a vision statement and to have that collaboratively done and then having maybe the top five or six values that they share that are going to be important characteristics defining that particular community mm -hmm. really helps new people. Well, it helps the people who are already in it with each other and are usually friends thinking like, okay, they're ready to make a big move, like maybe buy property together. Um, it's something that they can then remember and hold themselves and each other accountable to like, well, these are in our top values and this is how we said we were gonna demonstrate it. So including those <clears throat> just helps define the path forward. And um, also including sometimes um, if not, already at the very beginning, um, even from the closest two person household to a highly distributed community of different households, it's good to have a conflict resolution policy right. and some tools for that. Yes, because um, yeah, we're humans and there's, there's always gonna be conflict when you live with people, but it's how you handle it. And there's a big, I mean, there's a lot of learning in that. There's a lot of gifts with that of um, you know, creating a stronger household and um, mm -hmm. stronger relationships between people, um, you know, getting away from, well, a lot of us like to hide. What are we really feeling you know, out of shame or guilt or embarrassment right. or whatever reasons? And that's not gonna work very well in a, in a shared community. That's right. That was one of the things I was drawn to is rather than sort of a beat around the bush or hide your feelings type of lifestyle that I was actually raised in, I found it tremendously freeing, uh, always um, learning more about myself to live in community, and especially if it's just overtly a kind of feedback friendly place. And for people to say out loud, like, um, I, if you're going to do that, I prefer that you not do it here, or that doesn't fit with the values of the community, and I have a problem with that, blah, blah, blah. Um, and also just to bring it out to each other. Um, saying, acknowledging and verbalizing a difference or an affect that I have over here that seems to be triggered by something happening over there is um, just psychologically healthy, but also it does, as you kind of inferred, it strengthens the relationships there and is a point of saying, you know, I'm willing to be honest. I'm willing to say, hey, this is a difference and it's become a problem for me. And when you get to that point of honesty, and then can clarify and together maybe um, come up with options like then what do we do to resolve this that really makes it's a model for other people to see that oh that can be done well it can be done safely people don't have to either leave over it or fight overtly <laughs> it's it's really really healthy and so a lot of community life is working through i mean creating more problems like creating bigger visions and taking on more challenges so that we can like get in there and figure out how with all our different diverse needs and ideas and and wants how are we going to get through this and make it good for all, workable for all? Yeah, right. And you mentioned the word safety, and I was going to bring that up too because it's about it's about creating a safe container where people can share um, freely and not feel they're going to be um, judged or blamed. Or I mean, there's there's a lot that goes into that of creating the safe container, which which goes in with your ground rules that you create. Yeah. And so so that's great. Well. Uh, another aspect of it is in these communities is creating a sustainable culture. How does that play? And we're all wanting to um, help in the way of us, uh, sustainability and the environment and all that. How do these communities uh, work um, towards that? Yeah, I think there's many ways to be sustainable. And a lot of times we just think of the environment and ecological sustainability and sensitivity. But I wanna to touch on how community is like mentally and emotionally sustainable for a person, like to have the kind of support close at hand and have some relationships that are defined. I mean, some people have good friends or they'll have their partners and families, but a lot of people who are living alone don't have that. So it's a real boon to know that there's some other people we can rely on. Mm -hmm. um, it makes it more physically safe and secure and um, sustains a place when multiple people have their muscles, their minds, their creativity applied to maintaining a place. And then um, I'll speak to this like ecological point of view that where's 
you know, having two or five or 10 people live together rather than heating and cooling and having different structures for all those different people. If we're living together, then we can share the space and maintain that all the better and share the tools and the appliances and not have to have that replicated in every different household. We can share that and that you know economizes as well as better for the earth. Yes, and that, that also brings me uh, to think about how communities can do that, like a neighborhood or a street could join in sharing their uh, garden tools, the wheelbarrow, the lawnmowers, because you know every house tends to have one, and you know we use it what how often <laughs> we use the um, lawnmower once a week or once every other week or a wheelbarrow. Um, once a season, you yeah, know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's um, there's also uh, I think there's some neighborhoods that are creating these spaces. Yeah, I don't know how much that is um, gaining traction in other areas, but in Seattle, multiple neighborhoods have created tool libraries, and there's a way that it can be checked out. You can become a member maybe for a nominal fee, and sometimes it's just happened naturally between neighbors you know people down the block people on this side of the street like we all know we can use so and so's hedge cutter and this lawnmower but now it's become really institutionalized that several neighborhoods have these tool libraries and then each tool is well maintained you, you know individually you don't have to maintain it but there's some people that are staff and make sure they're cleaned properly and blades sharpened or whatever and um so that's a wonderful thing to see and i'll just credit i think you know some of the neighborhood centers um, and, and the city might have helped promote it, but I think a lot of this came up through in the 90s. The Sustainable Ballard was the first and then Sustainable Neighborhoods Movement moved throughout Seattle and the Puget Sound. So now there's something that's a website called Scallops and you could look up and see some of the sustainable resources, um, meetings, local currencies, tools sharing projects that go on and Scallops stands for sustainable communities all over Puget Sound. So scallops.org should be out there. Yeah, so these are things that are really helpful to, to learn about. And because um, I think sometimes we don't, we don't know these things. And so we don't even, we don't know they exist. So we don't even look. So it's fabulous to get that information out there. So what sort of person do you think would get the most value from your workshop? Who's who, you know, uh, looking for intentional community that, and or the different ways that you can, you know, just, just learning about it. I think there's, I'm hearing more and more younger people excited about this, like more so than just like a shared house. Many of the groups that I hear about with people 35 and under are really identifying as intentional communities and they might not yet own that property or any other property together, but sometimes the student cooperatives, um, in a college area, a college town have persisted and they'll be maintained by like say a cooperative entity. Right now, I think um, tons of young people are just looking for more ways to share resources, have a sense of meaning and lifestyle choices and not have to do what it takes to like say, rent a market rate apartment by one's own. <clears throat> all on one's own, that's pretty expensive, but there's, you know, all sorts of cultural work workers and artists and um, lesser inclined to do like a corporate path job, whatever. Um, so they might have like less of a salary <clears throat> and um, don't have maybe the equity right now to put down a down payment, but many, many young people are seeking to form um, communities of shared values and shared interests together. And then there's also another set of people who like might have lived in a shared situation in college, had some good experiences, but then some like, mm, I don't know, you know, everyone's transitory and we didn't really know what we were doing. So they're, they're intrigued with the idea of like finding something like that again. And some people are maybe even at a space where I want something really different. I want to, you know, get out of the city and do something that's maybe like eco village or regenerative agriculture there's projects like that and then lastly i would say someone who would get a lot out of my particular workshop is someone who might not think okay i'm not going to go and live in a commune or an eco village but 
I have one or more extra bedrooms free. And I've been thinking about the idea that it would be really great to have a housemate, at least one, that would be like a friend and a helper. We could cooperate. We would be more efficient to just cook meals and do some of these things together with at least one other person. But they don't know where to put the word out and they don't know how to safely go through the process of selecting. And so um, they would find a lot of benefit and some resources through what I'll be able to point to in the workshop for people who just want to share a house. I, I think also there's single women, um, older women who probably yes. don't want to go to retirement home, uh, would like to live though with with people as smaller, like in a house and you share it and, and looking for that, looking for people that you might want to live the last 20 years of your life or whatever, and feel that support that you're talking about, that sustainability of that support of not being alone when you're when you're older and all that. So I think there's even a community of, of women there that would be interesting. Right. Here we are scrambling to try to build a lot more affordable housing and that's fine, you know, to have more units that are new is great. But a real hidden resource is that a lot of the, you know, older generations in our area, at least in a um, kind of high cost real estate and rental market, they're sitting on single family designed homes with one or more bedrooms available, but that could really be put to good use for having just a complimentary other housemate or even maybe several people. And um, I've heard of some that would rent out a bedroom for an office for someone part-time, maybe not live there all the time. Someone else they'll rent a bedroom or a whole suite or wing of their house that they have access to and can get a lot of help, you know, with, expenses by having someone help out doing that and they also might have a book group or something else if say they want to have that there might be a meetup group or some other thing where they could be a neighborhood resource to be used once a week or once a month and benefit from having this room that's otherwise just sitting there um, be used by people to learn who else has these shared values who has these interests it might not even be about living together but meeting more of your neighbors and you know it could be entirely fiction, but just to read books together and the pleasure of, you know, sharing in arts and literature. It's just so great to have a starting point like that. Yeah. So there's so many opportunities when you think about it. Well, the other thing that you're going to be doing is moderating a panel at the conference. It's on Sunday, March 14th. It's called Co-Creating and Sharing Resources to Reinvent Community. And you have quite a diverse group of women that are joining you. And they're going to be touching on um, different topics, um, grassroots projects in public spaces, shared gardens, um, uh, providing local food, you know, all, all sorts of different things where we can um, also it'll, it'll expand everybody's horizons of what 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 is thought about in community and all the yeah. different opportunities out there. We're having these diverse women. So let's talk. I'd love for you to share a little bit about that. Yeah, we want to um, really bring up the whole um, continuum and sometimes uh, attention between the different extremes of diversity and similarity or, you know, um, things being alike. And there can be a beautiful unity in diversity. And we're going to talk about different ways to be inclusive, how to invite diversity, how to respect the diversity that exists and, and relate to that, um, to be culturally competent. We'll touch on all these issues. And then we'll talk about some of the practical outcomes that are projects that these women are, have started, founding a farm, you know, local, accessible, healthy, organically grown food farm. And, um, it's maybe not large when people think of farm that's way out in a rural situation, but it is an accessible neighborhood farm and more and more of these. It's not just a single example. There's pea patches that are gardens and other um, realistically, you know, diverse enough to be called a farm that are in our area. So we'll point out some of those. Um, also with shaping public spaces and especially streets so that they are more accessible, safe, and welcoming to pedestrians and bicyclists and the people who live on them. So for instance, we have someone from Portland City Repair who's gonna talk about using natural materials to make little benches or conversation points, doing um, painting of an intersection and getting neighbors and the 
people of all generations and backgrounds to come together and work on creating this lasting piece of art. So there's just many ways to involve people in creating a community shared space that doesn't necessarily mean within someone's own home. So. Yeah, they, and uh, since COVID, like our, we live on a corner and our street is a walking street. They've created a lot of walking streets when COVID happened mm -hmm. and now they're permanent. So it's gonna be a permanent walking street. Then they, they, they put out a survey and there was talk of like, well, um, and I always thought, well, that'd be a great place for art. And Chris, I got an email. I was like, oh, I'm not in a position to do. It. I'd love to work with somebody or help out, but I'm not in one to to create the art. But it's it's um, yeah, it's just a great way to get in touch with who your neighbors are. And exactly, and make it feel more like a village, which was the um, initial idea of Portland's city repair. There is, or there has been. I don't know how active there is an organization in Seattle called City Repair. But in Portland, um, they were hosting something called like the village building convergence. And so thinking of ways that we can build things and shape the communities wherever we live to be more village like. And so that was that kind of thing is like create spots to stop and talk. And it's related to like the small library movement or um, a neighborhood sort of help yourself food bank, but it's just like a little windowed uh, cupboard or something like that, that you might find randomly. So it's just thinking about ways that someone can be helped when you have something that you have ample amounts of or knowledge to share. That's just sort of the beginning point of what is a sense of community, which I think in the larger culture gets watered down. And a lot of people don't realize the ways that it can be made more concrete and even more supportive nurturing beneficial than just like a shared sense of identity right of opinions or some people think of you know um community as just where they live their neighborhood but it could be more um v vital it could be more infused with a sense of community i bet wherever you are yeah i love that sometimes you know when you travel or even your own city and you go to a new place and in your city and you see these little things, little a little binge, a little, you know, and it's, it makes you feel so good. I just remember, it's like, wow, this is, I remember being up in Vancouver and the, you know, the, um, the electrical, um, um, I think it's like a telephone, there's these big metal boxes on the corners and they, they've painted them with art. You know, they've, mm -hmm. had, they've had artists go and, and wonderful scenes. And I thought, oh, that'd be great to do in Seattle. And then I, I've seen a few in Seattle, but not to the extent that I saw in Vancouver. And um, just little things like that make you smile, make you feel good. Right. You know, you're, you're part, there's value in your community. Right. It's, it's a, a new th thought to say, oh, you know, life is not all utilitarian. We're here to share art and probably someone local um, who is an artist or an aspiring artist got paid to do that. And, you know, many implications, but just those things that invite a, uh, happy thought that invite some sort of social oriented thought or like the places that are actually a stop, slow down, chat, have a conversation here. Those are the kind of things that City Repair has really excelled in. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully it gets um, repeated in other cities. I'm, I'm sure it's these things that does happen sometimes, you know, when people find out and they take it, they move to another city. You know, hey, it does exist in other cities, yes. Yeah. That's good. So you did mention inclusivity. And one of the things is intentional community. If you start creating your values and and creating things that you can you could lose touch with um, that it might exclude people because of you're looking for similarities and it gets kind of a narrow vision mm -hmm. and it's it, you lose that sense of inclusivity of broad broadening our our um, communities to be have more diversity in them. Right, I appreciate you um, bringing that up because I think we um, often due to our um, inherent uh, bias to think that people we're gonna get along with are gonna be much like us. Um, we have to get out of thinking that that's always the case. And there is, like I was mentioning, a tension between diversity and sameness, but within diversity, there can be unity in what the goals are and the values shared about how we'll get there. So like any strong natural ecosystem, the strongest has unity in diversity. A monocrop situation is not the strongest, it's very vulnerable. 
but having diversity in any ecosystem, just like a human ecosystem with all our different creativities um, put together, we can really come up with better solutions that way. And so for groups who typically have, you know, in the intentional communities movement, been largely white, um, and a lot of those that are known and get publicity are ownership ones, like say co-housing, um, is because they had wealth and they had the privilege to sort of step out of whatever was the mainstream culture that they were in and wanted to create something that had a tighter sense of community. So I'm gonna speak to that and other people were gonna speak of being on the margins and being non-white. And so the diversity on the panel itself will take different angles and approaching how to be inclusive and not just recruit people for some token representativeness, but um, to go out, not just sit where we are and say, oh, well, yeah, you can come see us, come visit us, but you know, really take note into doing our own work first and um, thinking about where we're putting out our ads or doing outreach, what kind of places we're going to to network. Um, and then, um, having some statements about it, having some statements that show we understand uh, an equity lens and what is there that would make someone feel really at home and have the access to influence the community culture the way that they want to and not just conform to a way that it was like, mm, this is, you know, mainly white culture dominated or, you know, so we will, we'll look at those aspects. Yeah, and it's and that's again our our inner work of looking at our own biases and um, and and then appreciating the value of diversity and what that can bring to your community. It, um, it's it's kind of it's in the forefront now. It's something we have to be more conscious of and, and really work at. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that the um, cultural competencies will be be like the leading thing in this next year or two with um, whatever were the other shared values that communities had, um, there's going to be, I'm sure, taking a stronger look at, through the equity lens of like, how can we do what we are going to do and be more inclusive in the way that we are doing our outreach. Yes. So what would you uh, like to leave the listeners with today? Um, uh, less, less words of wisdom. You have a lot. <laughs> Well, I just hope that in the many ways that we've just touched on um, from what we'll cover in the panel and my workshop, but the whole Women of Wisdoms conference, I think we um, can expect to, if you participate in any part of it, you'll go away with an idea that community is really an important aspect to invest in and be part of and to experience that through cooperation and sharing, that it's not something you're giving up and that we'll have less of something by sharing, but there's just so much to be gained by experimenting with learning how to share well and have that mutual benefit. That's great. Those, thank you so much for being on the show today, Sid. Thanks, Chris. So you can visit Sid's website at www.under1, and that's just the number one, roof.info under one roof.info and you can go to the woman of wisdom website womanofwisdom.org and check out all the offerings we have for the conference march 11th through the 14th there's early bird special ends january 18th and you won't want to miss that it's a great price you can also register for just one day if you don't have the full weekend although i encourage you to go the whole weekend because that's a really gift for yourself and but you can register for Friday, Saturday or Sunday. There's also special prices for teens, for young women, 20 to 29, and also our seniors. It's so awesome. I'm so excited for that. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, thank you.